Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to U.S. Japan Research Institute Seminar on LG for Biofilms. And I'm Katsuichi Uchida, uh, president of this U.S. University Seminar, and also professor at Rome and Waseda Universities. First, uh, let me introduce USJR. USJR is a, a non-profit research institute uh, here in Washington, D.C. Uh, this was uh, established in April 2009 by leading Japanese universities <coughs> and now managed by eight uh, universities, namely Doshia, Keio, Kyoto, Ritsumeikan, uh, Kyushu, Ritsumeikan, Tsukuba, University of Tokyo, and Waseda Universities. USJR is financially supported by business societies of both the United States and Japan. The mission of USJR are to promote policy-related research based on academic data, to organize research teams, disperse their research results to a wider communities by the medium of English, and, and also to nurture young researchers relating to US Japan issues and to formulate a community of researchers and policymakers. USGI hold a week-long seminars twice a year in February and September. And, and occasionally seminars once a month here in Washington, D.C. We sometimes hold uh, symposiums in Japan. Uh, with regard to the details of our activities, please uh, visit our website. Uh, this week, from uh, Monday, from this Monday to Tuesday next week, we fought nine different events covering a wide range of topics. Please see the uh, schedules of USJR, and I hope you are uh, able to participate as many as possible. This morning, we we'll have our seminars on LG for biofuels. I'm afraid I, I, I'm a press blow. I do not know very much uh, on this subject. But we are very fortunate to have three experts on this important issue. Uh, she helped the speakers and panelists to really discuss this important issue from different viewpoints. Uh, uh, so I'm quite sure today's discussion will promote fruitful and productive uh, results. And before I introduce to today's moderator, Professor Peter Wilson of the University of Tasmania, I need to receive your permission to be videotaped. And also, that videotape will be open to the public through the uh, internet. Uh, first, uh, let me introduce Dr. Peter Wilson. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm Peter mindful of time, so I'm not going to talk for very long. But with this morning's session is about, do I have to use this for the recording? I'd rather not, unless you want me to. This morning's session, um, we'll look at, at what Japan is doing with algae for biofuels and what the USA is doing for algae for biofuels and and then sort of in a broader context and then a finally as a third speaker I will just look at a small detail on cold water algae for biofuels but first speaker Professor Sharewa from the University of Tsukuba will will give us an overview of what scuba dye is doing in this in this arena scuba dye is probably the, certainly the Japanese leader in algae for biofuels um, and has been, Professor Shirewa and his colleague Watanabe Sensei have been studying this for many years and are very, very expert on culturing algae for biofuels. And then the second speaker, Tony Hamid, Professor Hamid from um, Scripps Institution of Oceanography, will have a look at what America and, and in fact Australia are, are doing in this field, algae. Um, and will give us a, a very broad overview of, of what UCSD and Scripps are doing. And then, and then as I said, I'll give us a small a technical look at cold water algae and what happens when they come in contact with ice. Where are we going to grow these algae in the future? Hot, hot deserts, as Tony will show us, or cold water north of, north of America or Japan. So, so by the end of the session, we will have a, a nice overview of what's happening in both countries, and, and I'm hoping that both countries will collaborate even more closely after after we uh, see what we're each doing in this. So, Professor Shreya, please. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Peter, for introduction. So, uh, I will 
will start my talk. And first of all, thank you very much for coming to this seminar. Now, there is a different one. <laughs> this one. It's okay, you can give my talk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Too difficult for me. <laughs> okay. Hey, I'm going to talk about a uh, little bit about Michael Algal Biofuel Production Project, which uh, we are doing in the Tsukuba University. So uh, I want to shortly introduce our university of Tsukuba. So uh, only one Japanese university which has a Nobel Prize holder and gold medalist in the Olympic. So uh, some of the people are so famous, and especially judo founder Jigoro Kano is a most important person in the history of uh, our university. So uh, as you know, uh, the uh, global warming or increase in atmospheric CO2 concentration uh, makes uh, various damages on the environment. So one of them is the ocean acidification. As you know, in a, for example, in the Florida case, the uh, coral reefs are already broken by acidification. And this acidification effect is most, uh, more stronger in high latitude, yeah, Antarctic or Arctic regions. So uh, we will have a very big damage from the increase in atmospheric CO2 content. So uh, we have to reduce. So that's the key uh, of this, to this talk. So this slide shows that how the Arctic ice is becoming smaller year by year. So this right shows. Yep. I didn't touch anything. <laughs> Better to use my computer or the right. So this slide shows uh, the change in the uh, Arctic ice size from 2002 to 2007. As you see here, so a uh, area becoming smaller and smaller year by year. And the thickness of iceberg in the Arctic region it's a highest in the about five meter. That also is going uh, to be reduced year by year. So that is the effect of some warming of the ocean temperature. So therefore, we need to stop the increase in atmospheric CO2 concentration. Then this paper came out in 2009 in Nature, algae bloom again. So that means algae bloom is happening in the ocean in science, in the scientific words. But this shows the algal research on biofuel production just explored recently. So because microalgal photosynthesis can fix the CO2, it's very effective to reduce CO2 from atmosphere. And microalgae can fix the CO2 at the surface ocean, then can transport CO2 from the surface to the ocean sediment. That's quite effective to reduce atmospheric CO2 concentration. It's proven already by uh, geologists. As you see here in the slide, this is the uh, green line show the oil production, 
and this a line show the temperature and this is the Cretaceous era and during the Cretaceous era huge amount of black shells gas and oil were produced and preserved in this ocean setting. At the time the Far East countries are like this way and now the crude oil is produced in the Far East countries. It's quite well known that the those CO2 was fixed by microalgae in the Cretaceous era and preserved as a crude oil. So now we are just uh, uh, getting those CO2 fixed very long time ago, then again emit those carbon dioxide from the sediments to the atmosphere. That is the, exactly the global warming effect. Next slide shows that's calcium carbonate precipitate, which was produced by macroalgae. This picture shows the famous white cliff in Dover. So white cliff in Dover is made of this calcium carbonate, like this one, which was produced by marine phytoplankton. In the North Sea, so huge amount of gas and oils are now produced in the region, but those gases and the crude oils were the product of marine phytoplankton, which was fixed in the Cretaceous era. This organism, the name is the Emiliani Hatsia, that's a corpus of forage. It's a taxonomic name in a biology. So this organism has a custom carbonate crystals on the cell surface. And this is the source of the limestone in White Cliff in Dover. And inside, organic birds became a petroleum source for the crude oil. So as you see here, the about 100 kiloton calcium carbonate precipitates are fixed by this organism in the ocean and transported from the surface to the sediment in a day. So this organism is a quite uh, useful for fixing atmospheric CO2 to produce calcium carbonate that the ionic carbon storage and organic carbon storage as petroleum or crude oils. So the Japanese government, especially JST, Japan Science, Japanese, Japanese Agency, and Science and Technology, just started to support this kind of algal biofuel production research. So our project is supported by Cresto. So a, we are running a five years project under the support of this Crest project. There are so many teams in this project and the supervisor of the whole project is the Professor Matsunaga, the president of the University of uh, Agriculture and Technology. So what can be produced from algae? So there are two kinds, simply microalgae and macroalgae. Microalgae is a single cell phytoplankton. The macroalgae is a, a huge, big uh, algae uh, kelp, such as giant kelp. So a microalgae has a potential to produce hydrogen, hydrocarbons, 
lipid, carbohydrate, and biomass itself. Microalgae can produce carbohydrates and by huge biomass, but it's mostly made of cellulose. That cannot produce high amount of hydrogen, hydrocarbons, and the lipids. So, from this point of view, microalgae has more potential to produce biofuels than macroalgae. So, as a result, we will be able to get hydrogen gas, alkanes that can be used as a tropic fuel and biodiesel, the alcohol, and the methane gas. Of course, at this moment, production of hydrogen using microalgae, theoretically possible, and we get small amount of hydrogen production, but not enough for uh, practical use. It's also same for hydrocarbons and biodiesels, whatever, but technologies and engineering for the production of algal biofuels are progressing very quickly. So uh, we are doing more basic research, but other people, uh, many scientists in USA and Europe and Australian, so they are doing uh, mass cultivation because they have a huge land for uh, constructing a very big algal uh, cultivation plant. So what algae produces, which kind of lipid? This is a three acid glycerol. For example, plant, higher plant, land plant produces lipid as 3 acid glycerol, shown here, as plant oil, or eat sunflower, whatever. This 3 acid glycerol contains glycerol part and fatty acid part to use this TAG as fuel we need to have a chemical process, methylation of a methanol treatment. To, produce, to process this, we need huge amount of methanol. So TAG, of course, it's possible to use that biodiesel production, but it needs a complicated uh, chemical process to produce Biodiesel. On the other hand, mycology can produce biofuels, which is called as dropping fuel. Dropping fuel is can be directly useful, useful to by mixing with gasoline to drive a car or if the carbon chain is a liquid, that compound can be used as duty fuel directly. So we are focusing, Scuba University people are more focusing on this kind of dropping fuel production. So this is Botryococcus brownie, it's a green algae, freshwater algae, produces Botryococcus like this. And uh, our university, Professor Watanabe, I uh, just uh, demonstrated that driving a car using this total cost. So I'm focusing on this kind of lipids called alkinol, which is produced by this marine-fight plant. This much plant, marine-fight plant that produces huge bloom in the ocean every day. You can just access to the internet of NASA then you will find this kind of uh, figure. This is the brood growth of marine phytoplankton of this one. This is the Newfoundland, and you can see this in the Bering Sea of, or in the, uh, at the north of Atlantic Ocean too. This is the purified alkenomorphin. Unfortunately, 
This has a carbon number 37, it's long, therefore it's a phase at the room temperature. But this compound is produced in the cell, like this one, in a lipid body, and when you just dry the cell and push it, then this kind of lipid coming out from the pellet. So this shows the chemical structure of this alkanol, which has a rather long chain. But it's quite different from fatty acid. This slide shows, we just tested, which organism is good for the biofuel production. This is cyanobacteria, and the green algae, Hot fighter, this is the, our organism, and urea. So, lipid composition, you can see the big difference between these three and our material. So, fatty acid material starts production is dominant in these three organisms, microalgae, but less in our organism. But instead, alkenes and alkenones are dominant in this organism. So when we try the pyrolytic degradation, we could get more crude oil components in comparison with the other three microalgae. Therefore, we try to make more production of this compound using uh, lipidomic study and gene, gene technology. So we can provide good organism which has a high potential to produce useful uh, biofuels. Then we worked on the metabolism, how this compound is synthesized biologically and metabolism in metabolism. So it's quite, we found that it's a, there is a completely different pathway uh, from the, this kind of long chain uh, unsaturated fatty acid. So we tested, examined the C, fixed the CO2, this carbon rich compound. Uh, this carbon is going to which compound? So, <coughs> lipid or polysaccharide or whatever. Finally, we found that this organism is quite special. It's quite different from other microalgae. It produces lipids of this amount and has no neutral polysaccharide. That means usual other common microalgae produces neutral polysaccharide as a carbon straight compound, but this organism produces lipid, which has straight chain. That is quite advantageous for the production of very special biofuel. We studied also the DHA production that is the unsaturated fatty acid, and this organism has two pathways, plant type and animal type. So this organism, haptophyte, is a second, it's called as the secondary symbiotic microalgae that contains the plant type of metabolism and animal type of metabolism for the production of DHA that's also academically quite uh, special. And also we found that the genes and proteins, enzymes, which can produce, which is associated with the production of these long chain ketones, that is alkenones. We got already almost the result on that. And also we collected hundreds of strains from 
or culture correction of the, all over the world. Then we went to the Arctic Ocean to collect new species of this marine white plankton and found that the content of lip, this kind of lipid oils, alkenes and the retinols are quite different among the strains. So that means if we can select best one, we can uh, get the organism which is the best for the production of, for example, the alkanes with carbon chain C20 or something. Alkanes, for example, the C uh, with carbon number C8 to 18, that it can be directly used as jet fuel. So recently, we found that the species strains which can produce C29 alkane. So uh, maybe we are expecting that we are able to find other strains which can produce produce C9 to 18 alkanes. So we get this uh, compound in huge amount in our laboratory, but if we can produce C19, 9 to 18 alkanes, so this can be directly used for jet fuel. So we are looking for the now currently alkane producing energy. There is no report up to date, but in Manufacture plankton, but some of cyanobacteria very long time ago, cyanobacteria produced very tiny, tiny amount of alkanes. But we are expecting that we are going to search more various kinds of microfine plankton. It will be possible to get such kind of special uh, micro. So this shows a bloom of this phytoplankton in the Bering Sea. 2010, there was a cruise of Japanese research vessel Mirai. And they went to the Arctic Ocean. And I sent my fossil on board, then succeeded to collect these spaces in the Arctic Ocean, in the Chakti Sea in the Arctic Ocean. And surprisingly, this Arctic strain could, can grow even at 10 degree, and also we have another data, 5 degree is a no problem for this strain. But other, this kind of strain, which are collected in other places of the ocean, could not survive at five degrees at all. So we are studying all this strain at this moment, why they can survive at such a low temperature and can produce high amount of this special lipid as a storage compound. So this may be the last slide. So I, I just compared uh, how long the development of technology took. So for the, from the uh, first locomotive to the uh, linear motor car in Japan, it took about 250 years. But Aga research just started 1951 as mass cultivation that is in Japan and, and it, it's just only 65 years. So maybe until 2030 or somewhere I will be able to produce huge algal biofuels 
this is now, this is a picture from the internet, this is a picture maybe from the uh, algal mass cultivation facility in California maybe, or in USA. So, I hope we are doing the basic research, but on the other hand, so many other people and companies are trying to develop this mass cultivation system to combine these a basic and applied uh, knowledge so, and technologies. Uh, I believe that we will be able to produce more algal biofuels in the future. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Madam Leader. Thank you. 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 Anyway, any quick questions for Professor Sharewa? Please. Hi. Um, I was just hoping you could spend a couple seconds explaining a bit more of the objectives of the uh, CREST program, the $60 million in funding over five years. What, what uh, uh, you yeah. hope to come out of that? Some uh, uh, team uh, starting on the marine diatoms to produce a Triassic crystal. And some group is trying to develop a so-called cyanofactory, that is the uh, microalgal biotechnology. So uh, basic uh, development of basic gene technology to manipulate genes in microalgae. So they believe that uh, that technology can be useful for uh, producing uh, new metabolic pathway in a very high, rapidly growing microalgae something. So, and another team is uh, studying on the uh, technology how to uh, grow the microalgae in a tank or in an open pond uh, with very high level. And also the product uh, of microalgae, uh, so uh, which kind of uh, some team are studying on the bio refinery production. So uh, which kind of uh, uh, products can be uh, produced from uh, algal uh, products, uh, something like that. Thank you. Any other quick question? All right, thank you, Professor Shreva. That was fascinating. And we thank have you. a very good understanding now of, of Emily and what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Hayman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wilson. Thank you to USJI for inviting me and for holding this uh, very interesting symposium. So I'm going to pick up on um, where the previous talk left off. And it's wonderful to have such an expert in algae uh, set the scene. So it makes it much easier for me to uh, go on and talk about other things. Uh, let me just talk about the uh, geography for a second. Uh, here we are in uh, Japan, and where Scripps Institution of Oceanography is located in the town of La Jolla, which is a suburb of San Diego. Um, some of the projects I'll be talking about for mass production are on the border of the Northern Territory and Western Australia, the state of Western Australia, in Northern Australia. Uh, that's the location of tiny uh, Wyndham Airport, which is also a, a seaport. And my colleague, Professor Wilson, is, uh, is working in Hobart, where I used to work as chief of CSIRO Marine and Atmospheric Research. So I hope that gives you uh, some idea of the scale of uh, the kind of research we're talking about here. Um, let me just say a few words about Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Scripps was founded in 1903. And very soon after that, we moved to this beach in, uh, in La Jolla. 
Uh, that's the, uh, that building you see there next to the water tower was built in 1910. And the director used to live upstairs and the laboratory was downstairs. They, they didn't let me live there when I was director. Um, it's a, now it's a very nice uh, suburb of San Diego. Uh, this is another view of the beach and uh, the downtown La Jolla. And this is uh, our aquarium, our public outreach uh, aquarium. So um, Scripps is now 112 years ago. And about 55 years ago, my very famous predecessor, Roger Revelle, did a number of very important things that we'll talk about today. Um, one of them was to decide that we needed to have a full campus of the University of California system right next to us. So he went to the trouble to spin off uh, a campus of the University of California. It was originally called U uh, UCLJ, now called UCSD, University of California, San Diego. Um, I think one of the most successful spin-offs ever, it's now in the, I think, the top 15 research universities in the world, one of the youngest, I think the youngest university to be in that category. So really due to the um, imagination of Roger Revelle. Uh, just to give you an idea of a, a couple of the experiments that um, my institution does that are relevant to uh, to this talk. Uh, just uh, a week or so ago, um, we finally were able to launch a this satellite that my colleague, Professor Francisco Valero, built starting 17 years ago. Uh, this satellite was originally called Triana. It's now called Discover. Uh, the story of the satellite will probably be several chapters in my memoirs, if I ever get to write them, and if the lawyers ever let me uh, publish the truth about them. But so, suffice it to say, this satellite is launched. It's actually a, uh, a satellite that orbits the sun. It doesn't orbit the Earth, but it orbits the sun at exactly the same speed as the, um, as the Earth. So it's always sitting perfectly between the sun and the Earth. Um, so unlike um, the so-called A train, the afternoon train of satellites, which are put in place by many nations that cross the equator about 1.30 in the afternoon, um, those are the Earth-observing satellites that measure all kinds of things, vector winds and photosynthetic activity and salinity now with the Argentine US satellite. This is not a satellite like that. It's not sitting at uh, 300 miles above the Earth. It's sitting uh, a million miles away from the Earth. Actually, it will sit. It's now on a 110-day voyage from Earth orbit out to um, Lagrange point one, which is the equigravitational place between the, the Sun and the Earth. Why is this important? Well, the reason the satellite was finally launched is that it has a sun-facing site that, that measures solar storms. So in, in fact, I think uh, really the, the most important reason that finally it was launched after 17 years is that, uh, is that the United States wanted to get the early warning of uh, solar storms, which can interrupt communication. Um, so it's, it's going to sit at this point here, L, L1, well, you can't see it on the screen, L1 between the sun and the Earth. Um, the reason that it's relevant today is that it has an Earth-facing side and it can measure the radiation coming from a hemisphere of the Earth, the Sun-facing side of the Earth. Um, and so it's quite a rigorous test of global warming. Uh, over a period of decades, it should be able to measure the heat radi radiating out of the Earth. And uh, if CO2 and methane are performing in the atmosphere as they do in the laboratory, which we certainly expect, then the amount of heat coming off the Earth should continue to decrease over time as it's trapped in the atmosphere and 93% of that heat uh, is transmitted into the ocean. So uh, that's uh, quite an important ex experiment that, uh, that uh, we and our partners at JPL and NIST and a number of other agencies uh, were responsible for building. Um, probably the most famous uh, result that uh, comes out of our institution. Uh, you already saw in the previous talk, this is um, an experiment by Charles David Keeling, starting in 1958, measuring the CO2 in the atmosphere. So in 1958, he started the measurements in uh, Mauna Loa, the volcano in Hawaii, also at the South Pole. These are the Mauna Loa experiments. And so since then, CO2 is measured to have increased by over 40%. 
just uh, last year we crossed 400 parts per million, uh, starting at 315 parts per million. Um, much of my time as director was spent in uh, raising money to continue these experiments, even though I think they're uh, quite famous experiments. It's hard to raise money. In fact, they're now supported by uh, Wendy Schmidt and her husband from, uh, from Google. Uh, if we go back in time and look at the CO2 concentration from bubbles that are trapped in Antarctic ice, uh, then you can measure the concentration in the laboratory going back to uh, 1750. So you see that um, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere was stable at about 280 parts per million, and uh, it's now over 400 parts per million. We know that that um, CO2 is from human intervention because we can measure the isotopic ratio. So uh, carbon that exists in the atmosphere has a certain ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-13 to carbon-14. Uh, carbon that's been buried in the Earth for millennia is, of course, depleted in the isotopes of 13 and 14. So my colleagues over a period of 55 years have measured the isotopic ratio of carbon-12, 13, and 14 in the atmosphere, and that's decreasing as it would exactly as you would expect if you're injecting ancient carbon into the atmosphere. Uh, so that's going back several hundred years. If we go back now uh, into ice cores in Greenland or Antarctica or indeed into sedimentary cores, uh, we see the fluctuation, the natural fluctuation of CO2 due to the wobble in the Earth's orbit and the change in uh, vegetation in the planetary surface. That wobble is, of course, um, a completely diff different mechanism of creating global warming. Um, we humans have discovered a new one, and you see at the far right of this curve the concentration leaping up from 280 to past 400 parts per million. So, um, as was explained in the first talk, this um, wild increase in the amount of CO2 from the burning of fossil fuels uh, gives us quite a conundrum. Uh, I think we all want to continue to be able to burn liquid fuel we certainly don't have any substitutes for airplanes or ships or heavy machinery. Uh, where I live in San Diego, we have more than 10,000 electric vehicles, so the automobile may someday be, uh, be replaced by uh, battery-powered vehicles. But we don't have energy density sufficiently high in order to fly airplanes or move heavy equipment. So as far as I can see, most people can see, we're going to continue to need uh, liquid fuel. And that means we need to stabilize our uh, emission of CO2. And so algae are the answer. Algae are little organisms put here on Earth to do nothing but take sunlight and sun up CO2 and turn it into fat and protein and the macroalgae cellulose. So they are the answer to our prayer. And was explained before, our current crude oil is nothing but ancient algae that did exactly that job millennia ago and has been buried under pressure and temperature in the earth to make uh, black crude. So what we're talking about now is uh, short-circuiting that process, is uh, making an almost break-even process. It's not quite break-even, of growing algae on the surface of the earth uh, and using it within weeks or a month uh, back into fuel and then taking in CO2 to grow the algae, releasing CO2 when we burn it in our airplanes, but um, stabilizing our output of CO2 at vastly lower levels, perhaps 90% reduction to our current CO2 levels. So um, it's all very well to solve the electricity problem. We can do that with solar and, and wind and uh, geothermal, maybe nuclear, if uh, you're a nation that likes that solution. But we're always going to need liquid fuel, and that's where I think uh, algae is the only uh, answer that I, I know of. Okay, and so uh, once you've decided that algae is the answer, we have to look at the uh, look at the ocean. By the way, this is a real picture of the ocean from Google Earth. My colleague Dave Sandwell actually provides the bathymetry for, uh, for Google Earth. So if you want to dive into Google Earth, you can actually go and explore the mountains on the bottom of the sea. Um, so when looked at 
correctly in my view. Uh, one side of the Earth is almost entirely ocean. Uh, and uh, if you look at the whole Earth, it's 71% ocean. Okay, so um, quite a while ago now, a number of countries started to study the production of uh, liquid fuel from algae. I mean, I have to say at Scripps, we're 112 years old, we've been studying algae for all of that time. In fact, a number of my colleagues, two of my colleagues, I think are probably the most famous algae researchers that have been in the field. I mean, it, it's extraordinary that algae are, are nothing but plants and probably the least studied plants of, of any plants on the world, or the terrestrial plants were investigated at great length. But for some reason, these uh, tiny uh, aquatic plants that are so important for uh, everything that goes on in the world were neglected. So for 100 years, nobody cared that we were studying algae. But suddenly, when people realized maybe they're the solution to our liquid fuel problem, there was quite a, an investment in uh, algae research. And um, one of the leaders in that field was the U.S. Department of Energy. And um, I think it'll, it's a very interesting story that um, the Department of Energy has always been just ahead of the problems as they've, uh, as they've announced themselves. So um, until a year ago, uh, we were thinking that we should try to make liquid fuel at about $120 a barrel. If you're familiar with that, you would, 120 US dollars for a, a barrel of oil. Uh, as I'm sure you know, the price of uh, a barrel of oil today is about $55, and a month ago it was $40. So under those circumstances, um, having a research project that's going to be competitive with $120 a barrel of oil doesn't sound so important anymore. Um, but a number of people, not, not me, but the a number of my colleagues and the U.S. Uh, Department of Energy anticipated the fact that um, probably to make a successful liquid fuel industry, we would have to make byproducts as well that were just as valuable as the fuel and perhaps even more valuable. And so if you go to uh, the U.S. Department of Energy uh, website, they have um, a very clever strategy that they um, already implemented. It seems to me very presciently uh, with what's called high value secondary products. And so the idea is that you get the algae in, in vast bulk to make the kind of uh, long chain hydrocarbons that we talked about in the previous talk. But at the same time, and hopefully not interfering with that production, you're getting them to make something else. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about. So what my colleagues at Scripps have focused on is making animal vaccines at the same time as they're making fuel. That's one of two strategies that uh, my colleagues at the University of California or San Diego are looking at. Um, the other strategy is to make human pharmaceuticals. And just last week, my colleague, uh, Professor Stephen Mayfield, who was a very famous uh, professor in uh, algae business, founded Sapphire Energy and, among uh, other companies. He announced the um, probable discovery of a probable malaria vaccine that's manufactured by algae. Um, what my colleagues decided to focus on was not that human uh, product, although it remains to be seen which is commercially the more successful strategy. I think they're both very interesting strategies. Um, but I like the idea of going after animal vaccines because algae are good at making things in vast volumes. You know, if we're making millions and millions of liters of, of fuel, uh, we're able to make millions and millions of liters of a solution that contains the high-value secondary product. And that, something that we need in that volume is, uh, is animal vaccines for production of chickens and beef and, um, and fish in, in, I'll talk about aquaculture in, in a little while. Um, by the way, Professor Wilson, you should remind me if I go over time, I, will, but I know this, this is heaven for a professor. I'm in a room with no clock. So 
So I, I will happily go on for the next two or three hours if there's, uh, if there's no interruption. Okay, so, so um, what I think is quite remarkable is the U.S. Department of Energy somehow saw this coming. I don't know if they knew the price of oil was going to go down or whether they realized that ultimately the success of the fuel program was going to depend on a higher value secondary product. But the grant program and the machinery for doing this were already in place before the price of oil went down. Uh, and so these are the criteria you want to make the fuel at the same time as you make the byproduct. And you don't want um, competition. Um, so there are lots of other things that you can do with, um, with algae. Uh, some, some of these are listed here. You can try and make um, silica frameworks. Um, you can make um, you know, protein production. But the target that I'm going to talk about today is, um, uh, is the higher value of secondary products to, um, to make animal vaccines. So this paper in 2013 is really a, a paper by my colleagues to, um, to talk about how um, we make more lipid, which is the material which ultimately uh, gets refined into uh, fuel. So just to pick out a, a few highlights of the previous talk, I mean, many of these algae double their mass over one day. I don't think we actually said that. But these are incredibly efficient little L L engines. And so if you were go to say to one of the pilot plants, for example, Sapphire Energy's pilot plant in New Mexico, where they're growing uh, algae from brackish water, um, they have hundreds of hectares of ponds that are designed to produce a million US gallons of fuel in a year. Um, and they're have a harvesting process, which is taking advantage of the fact that these algae are, um, are, are very efficient. Um, what's made from those ponds is what we call green crude. And that green crude needs to be refined very much like black crude is refined. And in just the same way that uh, each different discovery of crude oil in the ground has a slightly different composition and needs to be cracked or refined in a slightly different way. And the, and the traditional fossil fuel industry has become very skilled in breaking up that natural black crude into aviation fuel and automobile gasoline and diesel fuel and bunker oil for ships. So this green crude uh, needs to be refined. And if you were paying attention to the first talk you saw, um, that my colleagues in Sukuba have worked very hard to get much of that refining done in by the, the organisms themselves. So make the most favorable shaped organic molecule. Make C19 carbon, if that's the, the fuel that you're going to want to go after. Rather than doing that in post-processing, get the microorganism itself to, to do that processing. OK, so now let me talk about the um, the uh, animal vaccines. This is a collaboration of two of my colleagues at UCSD, uh, my colleague Mark Hildebrand, who's at Scripps, and uh, his colleague in the Department of Pathology at the University of California. So to make vaccines, there are a number of routes, which um, there, there are doctors in the audience who are more expert than I am. But killed pathogenic viruses are quite expensive. Um, there are um, some risks associated. Well, one has to be careful with a live, modified, or recombinant bacteria or virus, virus vac vaccines, because they might revert uh, to their original virulence. And um, so the expression of antigenic proteins to serve as vaccines is an attractive alternative. And that's what uh, Dr. Hildebrand and his team have been uh, exploring. So this is the particular organism uh, that my colleagues have been uh, handsomely funded to, uh, to study. And uh, the target is uh, a respiratory disease in cattle. So, and we're going after a number of different vaccines for different organisms. But the common denominator is these are vaccines that we need for vast animal production. So 
things that you would use in chicken farms all over the world or in cattle farms all over the world. And, and I hope, because I'm very interested in aquaculture, that someday um, we'll be able to look at um, vaccines for fish. Um, and so the, uh, the preliminary results on these compounds are extremely encouraging. And uh, I'm not an expert in the area, but I'm extremely um, uh, thrilled that my colleagues have been successfully um, raising funding for, uh, for these byproducts. So um, I do think it's not too early to think about a, um, a large-scale production of, uh, of an algae industry that's making both fuel and, and one of these high-value uh, secondary uh, products. So in view of the time, let me move on. Uh, I've already mentioned Sapphire uh, Energy, which has a very large pilot plant. Um, there have been so many uh, important developments over the last five years. Let me say that um, there's nothing like building a pilot plant to learn the practical difficulties of making millions and millions of liters of fuel from open air farms. Um, I was telling our colleagues that um, one of the problems sapphires had is in New Mexico is just dust blowing into the farms. It's not a very elegant problem, but it's a practical engineering problem that um, we all have to deal with. And, and, and uh, I'll talk about production in other deserts in uh, a little while. Um, the other thing that's very uh, interesting is um, once you have a source of um, sunlight and a source of CO2, you can either use the air. If you're lucky enough to be able to place your production plant near a source of CO2, so it might be an old-fashioned fossil fuel power plant, then if you bubble that um, CO2 through the pond, you can get increases in production. But then, of course, once you take care of the, the major inputs, you have to worry about the other nutrients. So there's been huge progress in the last few years uh, with a couple of techniques. Um, one that we're very excited about is preloading the nutrients with the algae. So as we, um, on a daily basis, are harvesting the algae, uh, at the same time as we restock those ponds, we, um, in a sense, don't add nutrient. We, it's already attached uh, to the, to the uh, incipient algae that's going to be put into the pond. Um, the second technique is to have other organisms growing in the pond that are providing nutrients, so pro providing the nitrate that uh, the algae need. Okay, so let me finish up by talking about two possible ways to grow enormous quantities of um, this algae. So this is a, a proposal uh, with three of my business partners some from former colleagues of CSIRO and, and some new colleagues. Um, and this is a proposal to grow, to have a huge algae farm basically in desert Australia. Um, wh why is it a good thing to, to do that in, uh, in Australia? Well, I'll, I'll try and uh, take you uh, through the ideas. So we have a US partner. Um, this proposal was uh, submitted quite a while ago to ARENA, which is the Australian Renewable Energy Agency. Um, and since then, there have been actually many changes to the Australian government. So uh, I wouldn't like to speak for the Australian government, but I think it's fair to say this proposal is not funded at the moment. But in previous governments, it's, uh, it's been very well received. I think Australia is going to turn out, ir irrespective of um, of which flavor of government is, uh, is in power in Australia. Um, 20 years from now, Australia is going to be one of the leading renewable energy capitals of the world just because of physics and chemistry. It has enormous solar intensity. It has um, enormous quantities of cheap land. And uh, it has a quite a stable economic uh, situation, even though last week and this week, you might argue that there's a little bit of political instability. Um, so first of all, um, there's a whole lot of sunlight in Australia. and um, There's readily available maps of exactly uh, how much solar intensity is, uh, is available. Um, and these are um, some of the highest values in the world. The other areas, uh, certainly some of the southwest in the United States, 
Saudi Arabia, UAE, there, there are a handful of areas around the world that are equal to, um, equally um, viable. Um, as um, Professor Wilson mentioned, uh, algae come in uh, thousands and thousands of different varieties, uh, some of which grow in cold water, some of which are growing in hot water. But all other things being equal, you'd, uh, if you'd like to produce products as quickly as possible, uh, if you grow algae in hot water, then you'll make the um, product more quickly. Uh, so warmer temperatures um, are an advantage. Um, and when this slide was written, Australia had uh, political stability. It has a very high um, uh, values on the um, economic stability index. Um, and it also has some potential high value customers. So the kind of customers that we were talking to uh, a couple of years ago, I think will, would end up being the first customers if, if this plant were to go into production. Are the airlines in Australia? Australia is um, surrounded by sea. Um, as a as sort of a G20 nation, it has a, a high number of citizens that need to fly. Um, and so the airlines in Australia are very supportive. Uh, the other target that we would have, of course, is the US Navy, the biggest investor in the world's oceans. Uh, so west of Guam, uh, we, we would try to be a stable liquid fuel supplier for, uh, for the US Navy. Um, why algae? Well, if you figure out how much land you would need to cultivate in order to make liquid fuel by various methods, you, you could use soybeans, you could use various kinds of grasses, um, it turns out if you want to replace half the liquid fuel used in Australia, you only need to cultivate this little green box, which is still a, a vast area, so that's about the same size as the contiguous 48 states in, uh, in, in the United States. Um, um, the other ways of making liquid fuel are really not practical in my view in terms of generating sufficient volume in order to, uh, in order to go ahead. Um, just to give you, so this project, um, whether or not my partners and I are able to be the ones to develop it, I think in the, in Northwest Australia, um, there are some very uh, interesting areas that have the right um, port infrastructure. That infrastructure really comes from the uh, the uh, traditional mining industry. Uh, there are a number of investors in Australia who are not uh, scared of building a port or an airport if that's what's necessary to. Uh, to get a product to, to market. Um, and I think the costs of, uh, of obtaining large quantities of land in, in, in uh, the desert next to coastal Australia are extremely favorable, uh, especially compared to uh, the southwest of the United States. So just to give you an idea of another project that's, um, that's going ahead in Australia, um, this company, Commodities Group, uh, COZ or COZ on the Australian Stock Exchange um, has been planning for some time to grow a very large uh, aquaculture project. The, um, the target species is Panias monodon, the black tiger prawn. Uh, I was lucky enough to have an aquaculture group uh, when I was chief of marine research at CSIRO. Um, that group is a partner in this project. Um, the, um, it's a very high value, high end uh, uh, prawn or shrimp, and this company is quite open about the fact that it um, it wants to grow a billion dollars of, of this seafood, export a billion dollars of this seafood uh, each year. So last week they announced that they have uh, acquired the rights to um, to uh, 10,000 hectares at this lagoon station, which is about three hours drive from the port of Windley in Western Australia, and about. You know, 12 hours drive from Darwin, which is a major port and uh, also a major airport. Um, now, why is this relevant to this project? Well, um, to grow prawns, um, you need a source of feed. And, and uh, like other seafood, uh, prawns and fish don't make omega-3. They eat omega-3, and uh, algae is the source of uh, omega-3. Um, so, actually, this is... This is the product before it's cooked. Um, it's something that um, CSIRO in Australia has a great deal of experience with. Um, 
this commodities group is a very interesting company. They um, they bought a lot of the existing corn farms in northeast Australia. Uh, they're now the largest um, seafood producer in Australia. They had a, a, a revenue of about five million dollars last year. They have all the hatcheries in place. They have a, a breeding program, and uh, I think they need to raise uh, about one and a half billion dollars in order to to build out um, the ponds. Um, this is an existing prawn farm, which is actually right next to the Gold Coast in Australia. It's a farm that um, we worked with very closely when I was at CSIRO. The ponds here are a bit smaller. These are, are three or four hectare ponds, uh, the ones that uh, the Commodities Group is proposing to, to uh, construct in the Northern Territory are quite a bit larger. Um, but this is actually very close to the tourist area of the Gold Coast in Australia, uh, which you may have heard of. Um, it's the, the idea here would be that um, well, we've experimented with growing algae actually in the prawn ponds. I think it probably turns out to be better to have separate prawns. So growing algae in one pond and doing that as part of the feed into the other pond to, to grow the prawn prawns. Uh, if you're not aware, this kind of aquaculture is very common in Asia. Uh, this is not in Australia and nothing of this scale, but there's um, enormous regions of Thailand and southern China and uh, some parts of Vietnam where there are just um, gigantic aquaculture uh, ponds. So um, to be just a little bit grand, um, if we think about a world where we have um, not the 7 billion people that we have now, but 11 billion people, which is where the U U UN estimate says uh, global population is going to stabilize. Um, the only conceivable diet that I can imagine is a Japanese diet for those 11 billion people. They're not going to be eating steaks or even kangaroo or horses from Europe or, or um, sheep. Uh, the major supply of protein uh, for those 11 billion people is going to have to be seafood and seaweed. Um, and so we have to somehow move from where we are in our agricultural practices, which are mostly confined to land, except for wild fisheries, into somehow using that 71% of the earth which is covered by water in a sustainable way to grow clean and healthy seafood, which is the, the protein source for for those 11 billion people. We have quite a journey to go on to do that, but I think we have all of the science and probably all the engineering we need to do that. I'm not sure we have the, the willpower. So I'm gonna finish there. The, the one point thing I didn't talk about is, um, is what we loosely call the Singapore project, and that is in macroalgae. Uh, obviously, to everybody, every country in the world needs liquid fuel, and uh, it's great if you have a desert where you can grow microalgae in ponds. Uh, I think that technology is, uh, is working right now. What we don't have at the moment is a way for Singapore or Puerto Rico or Hawaii to grow its own liquid fuel. Uh, it remains to be seen how we use the open ocean in order to do that. Uh, at Scripps, we, my colleagues have invested in techniques to try and grow macroalgae, which is seaweed, which can conceivably be grown in the open ocean offshore, surrounding any island state. But I think most observers would say we're probably 10 years behind in that thinking than, than we are in microalgae. But um, we've invested quite heavily in labs that, uh, that uh, <coughs> are beginning to put together the kind of uh, knowledge base we need in order to eventually produce liquid fuel and high value secondary products uh, from the open ocean. And there are quite a number of investigators around the world who are doing the same thing. So I think it's time for me to stop and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you too. Okay, any good questions for Professor Hayman? We'll have a chance in, in about a quarter of an hour, I think, for, for some overall, overall questions. Thank you, Mr. Hamer. That was fantastic. Now we know about Australia and the USA and Japan. So my, my presentation will be 
more brief and more, more technical, although I'll gloss over the technical part, and it will be to do with whether we will be growing microalgae in open oceans, but in the cool and frozen type those in open oceans. And so, um, I'll, go, I'll go fairly, fairly rapidly through the, I think I will. No, that wasn't the right one. We need to have the, not that power. Yeah, that might be then. So, um, I just want to look at whether freeze thaw cycles affect microalgae. And if, we, what we saw earlier in Professor Charay was slides was, a, was an algal bloom off Newfoundland, Newfoundland. Um, which was enormous, much bigger than the size of Japan. And, and in the winter that those oceans will be totally or partially frozen. And so are we going to be able to grow or farm microalgae in water, which is, we've seen that in some species, five degrees is no good for them. But some species are quite happy at zero degrees or even minus two. And so the question will be, can we can we utilize that, those types? I mean, look, on the right-hand side there, you see algae growing amongst sea ice quite happily, not being farmed, it just happens to be growing there. So, and, and again, as we've also seen, biofuels research is not quite where we want it yet. And, and, and Professor Hamish just showed us the, the graph with, or the, the plots on, on top of Australia where the algae small green box was the amount of land required to produce enough oil for Australia, fuel. So the question for my talk really is, um, Professor Hamer thinks, or has showed us that cheap land in warm, hot, I suppose, deserts uh, is an ideal place, plenty of sunlight. But then he also showed us a picture of the earth, which was entirely ocean, and so there's plenty of sunlight and plenty of ocean to be had. And so where, where will we be growing these algae? Is it in warm regions or in very cold regions? And so we'll have a look at that. Um, there, there have been, and you've seen, pictures of algal blooms in, in high latitudes, which, um, which seem to probably be increasing because of global warming. This symposium today is, is a very timely joint symposium between Japan and the USA to see, see how we can work together more closely on, on these things. That, the culturing of the algae and the genetic ma the manipulation are being done by both Sakuba and Scripps. Um, and together it's probable that we will come up with very very ideal solutions for these for these microalgae. I just need to get a little bit technical now. Some of these diatoms um, produce something called, called ice active substances, and we call them that because we don't really know what they are or what they do. But they, they, they you know, I've just shown you a picture of, of algae which are living in sea ice, and, and the question is, are they just coping or do they like it there? Presumably they like it there. And they have substances which stop them from dying when they're in contact with ice. There's a, there's a colleague of mine, and, or ours, Tony and, Tony and I, Jim Raymond, who has worked on these species for many years. And he found, when he was doing a freeze-thaw cycle, that that viability was up to 30% higher when the ice active substances were present. So they clearly are helping the viability, or helping the, the diatoms from being broken by the ice crystals, or maybe the ice active substances are creating a habitat for the diatoms to live in, a little slushy pond for the diatoms to live in. We're not sure which it is. But it's not anything to do with the inside or making the lipids, it's just the outside of the diatom. There's another group here who have, <coughs> who have looked at freeze-thaw cycles, which is really what I'm going to talk about just for the next five minutes on some arctic marine diatoms and they did what they found was contrary to what I've just shown you they found that um, reproducibility decreased after the first freeze thaw cycle and then even further after subsequent ones 
It seems a little strange. If, if these diatoms like living in the Arctic, you'd think they would be, co would be able to cope with freeze-thaw cycles, but, but it's, part, it's probable that the, the sea ice doesn't freeze and thaw every day. It just does that once a summer, or once a winter, I suppose. And um, so if we're going to grow, if we're going to grow algae in even colder waters north of Newfoundland, because there's plenty of water there and nobody's going to bother us and we can have our farms there. Will the, will the ice growing on the surface of the ocean or on the surface of the pond be a problem for these algae? I mean, that's what I'm talking about here today. The algae need to grow near the surface and ice grows near the surface. It grows at the surface of the oceans, it's not, not, not five or ten metres down. And so it is, it is an important thing to look at. And so let me just briefly talk about what I what I've found. What what we've done is taken some algae in, in salt water and cooled cooled them down until they froze and then warmed them up and cooled them down again and did multiple freeze thaw cycles to see if we could if I could come to an answer to what I just showed you the last two people's researchers um, work had, had not given us an answer to. Um, but I'm only talking about a few microliters. The the little circle in the middle of a of a uh, a little aluminium pan that's only the size of your fingernail. Um, so, so this experiment had, had been done on, in just a few microliters of, of solution, freezing it, thawing it, freezing it, thawing it, um, multiple times. And so that's that's a temperature trace of of the samples. That's what the data looks like. It's not particularly important. The fact is that it's it's called stochastic. It means that every time it freezes, it's at slightly a different temperature. It's not I'm not calling it random, but um, this, this little sample volume of liquid with diatoms in it, or with not di without diatoms in it, will freeze at a slightly different temperature every time. And so you'll understand why that's important in a minute. This is what, if I use just water, this is a, a curve for just the little pan, the size of your fingernail, and some water in it, and that's what the, the spread of temperatures of freezing looks like. Um, it's got a two degree ish spread of temperatures, two and a half maybe. And that the the best, well, the, the average temperature you'd like to call it is minus 23. So this little few microliters of water, super cooled to on average to minus 23. Sometimes it froze earlier and sometimes it froze later. The, the spread of temperatures is important for reasons we'll see in a minute. It's usually only one and a half degrees from one side to the other of the curve. So here's some, here's some temperate diatoms um, added, to, added to the same water in the same pan. And the average temperatures moved up to minus 20 degrees now. So the nucleation, the, the, the sample has frozen six degrees warmer than it had before. So these temperate diatoms have caused ice to start to grow inside the supercooled droplet. Not surprising, you've seen pictures of Emily before with this nice little beautifully arranged structure on the outside. But but the water is these things these things promote ice nucleation. They will cause the ice to grow earlier. If if you were really paying attention, in Shirego Sensei's third or fourth slide, he showed that there were volatiles called cloud nucleators that rose up into the atmosphere and um, they call cloud nucleators because the surface of these things causes the, this to happen. It causes the ice nucleation to happen. Um, the reason for this slide is simply that that curve is exact. Is not exactly. It's similar shape to my previous curve. So, so we have our little fingernail pan with a little bit of water in it, but now we've got diatoms, and they have caused nucleation at a higher temperature. And but the, but the physics of what's going on is the same. So one of those, and there was probably 10,000 diatoms in the, in the little droplet of water, and one of them was the best nucleator. One of them looked like an ice crystal and caused freezing to happen six degrees warmer on average than it had before. So the presence of diatoms increased ice formation by six degrees. If you, if you um, make the solution, if you add salt or sugar or, or nutrients to the solution, then it even can raise it by 10 degrees because um, because adding adding 
nutrients to the water, salts or sugars or um, anything else to the water, lowers the average supercooling by quite a lot, by, by twice as much as it would for the melting point, but that's not very important today. So here's some polar diatoms, same experiment in a different pan, the size of your fingernail, and they did not shift the survival curve in a similar way. They made it look like a different shape curve. That doesn't look like the, I know it's sort of a subtle change, but it doesn't look like the S curve that we saw earlier. What that means is, and this is counterintuitive, I, these, are, these are arctic polar diatoms, and you would think that they would cope with freezing, but they are not. They Either, in, in this sample, there were two nucleators, and it was causing a, the data to look funny, which is most unlikely, because always freezing will happen on the best nucleator, it doesn't matter whether there are two. Or the nucleation site is changing, which is what the second author found on my earlier slide. So, despite the fact that this, these arctic diatoms like living in cold regions, they do not cope well with multiple freeze-thaw cycles, which is something which will need further addressing or further experimentation if we're going to be growing cold water algae for biofuels in open ponds in north well, probably not south, but maybe south, south of Australia, but mostly likely in the north of So let's see who else is doing this. There's um, a new cold tolerant lipid strain being looked at in the Rocky Mountains. There's Woods Hole are developing a biofuel plant in, on Cape Cod. And admittedly, I don't know what's happened to it today. I haven't looked at the latest progress on that one. The Danes and Aarhus are, are looking at cold water algae as a source of biofuel, and, and clearly so is UCSD and SCUBA. So, so there's plenty of, what we've seen from, from Professor Hammond is that there's plenty of drive for this to happen. We need the fuel, we, and um, that need is not going to go away. Algae is much better at producing the fuel than corn uh, by, by hectare and although it grows faster in hot regions and deserts there is a lot of clean um, and available water in the oceans which we haven't really started to look at yet where we might be growing these things but um, it's, we're not there yet the Department of Energy don't think we're there yet the National Academy of Sciences, not quite sure that we're there yet. And this, this last one, Tony, Tony Hammond alluded to this as well. If we wanted 17% of the imports of petroleum to the USA, we'd need an area the size of South Carolina. So, um, but, but as, as Professor Hammond said, we haven't got much choice, really, but then to figure out where to grow these things. So, on that note, I shall stop and ask for questions on any of the talks, please, not just mine. Yes. Um, I have uh, two uh, small questions uh, for Dr. David. I'm not a scientist. <coughs> I'm not in a position to grab this, you know, the technical side of the, of the issues. But I'm interested in <coughs> more business aspects, more commercialization of, uh, of your uh, uh, high-value sector for that. The, any of the project which you are involved in has any private funding or either investment? And the second question is, if that Australia has advantages of those, you know, or perceived this uh, codex, what is the possibility of the other developing countries? Whether they have any similar advantages or to, to pursue? Because I was in the UNDP. I was uh, stationed in Malaysia, Nigeria, Somalia, and the Caribbean. So I'm just interested in how your pro or concepts or uh, technology could be used to enhance the economic development and for uh, you know global uh, needs of the oil, or rather uh, for that. Thank you. That's a very good question. Um, 
so before the change of government in Australia, uh, if we proceeded with the project I described in Australia, yes, it had private financing. Um, I don't have private financing today because of the delay in that project. Um, there are a number of companies in the United States that have raised very successfully private money. And I'm talking about something like $200 million. I'm not connected with those companies, unfortunately. Uh, but Sapphire Energy, for example, based in San Diego, is, a, um, is an example of such a company. Uh, it has um, both private money and it's competed uh, for money with the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Department of Energy uh, in its start. And there are half a dozen other companies that I would say are on a similar path. but. Um, the reason that we all mention um, Sapphire is that it's been very open about its pilot plant in New Mexico. So I was able to take, to get the former um, Minister for Resources in Australia to go and visit that pilot plant. Um, I suspect that the big US oil companies have um, projects at a similar size, but they haven't announced those projects. Um, but every now and then I hear that one or other of those companies has a very large project in Texas or somewhere with high solar in intensity. But as far as I know, none of them have been announced. Um, so I, in general, I would describe this as um, pre-competitive in a sense. I think the um, sudden change in the price of fossil fuel is a problem for the development of this industry. And that's why I think the US Department of Energy was quite prescient in having a program of high value secondary products. Now, there, uh, the ex real experts in algae can speak to this, but there are other things you can do with algae. There's a whole cosmetics industry. There's, um, there's uh, as I mentioned, fish food and so on. There's many things that one can do with algae. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the CEOs of an, another company in, in La Jolla says, you know, why not make cosmetics for $200 a gram rather than fuel for $100 a barrel? Uh, and there's a, there's a irresistible logic to, to that. Um, but I, I, think, um, I, I think this industry is going to develop. I just don't know how quickly it's going to develop. I hope I answered all the parts of, of your question. Oh, you asked about well, the developing countries. countries. Yeah. Well, I mean, the easy countries, you know, are any country that has a lot of cheap land. Um, now, in in the Sapphire pilot plant, it, the, that kind of algae that's grown is um, is an algae that grows well in brackish water, but closer to fresh water than to seawater. Uh, our project in Australia was designed to use seawater since the last thing you want to do in Australia is, is start an operation that needs a lot of fresh water because there isn't a lot of fresh water. So any country that has access to salt water and relatively cheap land, I think, uh, could take advantage of this technology. Um, and so, um, you know, countries where there are large aquaculture operations, so I mentioned a few, Vietnam, Thailand, uh, southern China, Indonesia, um, Saudi Arabia, has, you can see from Google Earth, has a gigantic set of, uh, of uh, prawn farms on the, on the south of Saudi Arabia. Uh, they they um, are sometimes productive, they're sometimes not operating. Um, any country that has uh, cheap land and access to seawater is a candidate for this kind of production. It, it, it could compete with um, with growing fish and uh, shrimp or prawns, or it could um, it could be a standalone uh, algae industry. I think um, what we're getting at in this seminar is trying to exploit the enormous array of algae that exist. I mean, thousands and thousands of species. Um, and a as you saw from the first talk, these algal blooms are in extraordinarily cold water in the Bering Sea. So. Um, really, these algae are extraordinary organisms. They're able to convert 
radiation and CO2 into fat and protein uh, under a wide range of temperatures. Um, and so I think for, for other nations, especially island nations, to participate in this liquid fuel industry, it's going to take another level of technology to grow the fuel, not on land, but in the ocean. So the Caribbean could be uh, one of the possible regions? Sorry, so Caribbeans? Caribbeans. Yes, yes, no, I mean, I talked to the former governor of Puerto Rico about that project. I mean, Puerto Rico or Hawaii, I mean, any island nation that consumes a lot of fuel. So Southern uh, Pacific? Southern Pacific, I mean, if, if, uh, if Kiribati doesn't submerge uh, too quickly, it could have uh, it could have its liquid fuel. I mean, these are, you know, the Australian island of Lord Howe Island um, off the coast of Australia has enormous expense every couple of years of taking uh, uh, an old-fashioned oil tanker there to a tiny little island. Um, now, it, it um, happens to have a very strong current going around the outside about two or three meters a second most most times of the year, so maybe it can get its energy from uh, from, from the ocean directly. But but any island nation, I think, uh, should be interested in, in the, the next set of developments here. Okay. Hey, hey, may I ask something? Yeah. And Cuba University will open the algae, algal biomass uh, energy research and development center in FLL. That is a supported by the investment. And also I have information that in Malaysia, that the not private, the governmental fund, will support the, the alpha farmers energy production and the newly farm constructed uh, so-called uh, academic, uh, academic city or uh, research city, research and Science, science city, like in Tsukuba in right. Japan. It, it, it's uh, one big project that's just planned. Okay. But it's just by the government. But in, in case of the Tsukuba uh, research center, that will be supported by the private. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Thank you. Any other questions for either of the speakers? Yeah. Um, how close is the uh, algae by final product fuel to hydrocarbon, can it be directly dropped into the infrastructure or do you have to still make some extra modifications or build some different types? Like ethanol can't always be directly dropped in. You have to, and if it's past certain concentration, you can't use it in the same types. At this moment, uh, today, uh, we need uh, extra processing uh -huh. still. But we are focusing on to get the Product which can be used directly, but the of course the biological product need uh, has a little bit problem in the quality, equality of quality. Yeah, uh, that means a, a algae produces everyday oils, but the quality and the quantity itself uh, same time. It's a different. So, but, but the how we need to develop a technology. How we can produce always the same compound. That is a, another a point we have to develop. But it's going on. It's possible. I, yeah, actually. yeah. I think so. I have a small practical example. Our students decided to enter a motorcycle race down Baja, California. So they grew the algae in the lab and refined it in a simple way and used that fuel a thousand kilometers down. So, um, you know, my understanding of it, it's, it's not that much different from refining black crude oil, something that the world is very skilled at. Can you make the short comment? Yeah, So, uh, for example, we have the uh, data of already. We we can we we can control the product. For example, the 
one molecule, even in a molecule, number of double can be regulated by our hand. So it, it, such kind of uh, technology at, at the same time is developed. Okay, thank you. Any other questions before we round this up? Yeah, just a very narrow, quick question. In this era of cheap oil, which is probably in the last months, not, not years, um, can some of these projects qualify for carbon credits in some way to make it more attractive for, for launching? Uh, it depends on the jurisdiction, of course. But um, uh, yes, in, the, in, the, in, in say, the uh, Quebec or California uh, carbon trading schemes, and in the previous carbon trading scheme in Australia that was abolished last year, uh, this kind of project would, would qualify. So uh, it's not something we emphasize these days because I think most of us think we can get the price down to be price competitive. And so we normally explain it as an added, an added bonus on top of, uh, I mean, in a country like Australia, there is the national security angle. I mean, uh, Australia used to have uh, oil supply uh, in the Bass Strait, for those of you who know that term, um, uh, that's dwindled to about 10% of Australia's supply. So Australia is totally dependent on its liquid fuel uh, other than natural gas, to, to put it totally dependent on oil coming from Singapore, where it's often refined in Singapore, not in Australia. So it's totally um, vulnerable to any kind of uh, sea lane instability. Uh, so part of this project was designed as a um, as a uh, secure liquid fuel source. Okay, so I think that um, I think that we've had a very a very good look at what's happening in algae for biofuels in the world, really, like in Japan and in America and Australia, and I think that it has given us much to think about, and I think that that the future looks very promising. Um, I'll just leave it to thank our speakers once again for sharing all of that with us this morning. Thanks very much.